It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Jim Blackburn. He's been a practicing environmental lawyer and planner since 1973. He's a professor in the practice of environmental law in the civil and environmental engineering department here at Rice, where he teaches environmental law and sustainable design courses. Um, Mr. Blackburn is also the co-director of the Severe Storm Prediction, Education, and Evacuation from Disaster Center here at Rice, where he also serves as a faculty scholar at the Baker Institute and director of the undergraduate minor in Energy and Water Sustainability. Um, Mr. Blackburn has authored numerous legal papers and has received um, advocacy awards both locally, state, and nationally. Um, and like um, Peggy Whitson, Mr. Blackburn is also um, an alum of Rice, having earned his Master of Science in Environmental Science here from Rice. So with that, let's please welcome Mr. Blackburn. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dan, and good morning. And it's a real pleasure to be here and talk about Houston at the crossroads. And I'm going to be talking about uh, flooding and carbon and how they're interrelated. And um, I want to start, though, with bl the blues. <laughs> Robert Johnson, uh, famous blues musician. Uh, there's a wonderful story about uh, Robert Johnson and the Crossroads. And apparently Robert Johnson used to hang around and try to play the guitar and couldn't play the guitar at all. And uh, left and went and got to the Crossroads, made a deal with the devil, and came back as a guitar-playing, wonderful blues musician. And um, some of you may think what I'm going to be talking about today sounds a bit like a deal with the devil, but um, I think we're going to have to learn to play the guitar a bit. So <laughs> Now, I've learned in Houston, if I can talk about money and ecology, if I can talk about money and most anything, I can hold an audience. So I want to talk about money as it relates to flooding and carbon. Now, let's talk a little bit about Houston's history. Um, Houston is the beneficiary of a hurricane that hit Galveston. I think all of you know about the 1900 hurricane. If you don't, Isaac Storm is a wonderful book to read. It's probably one of the best books I have ever read about hurricanes. Uh, but it demolished Galveston, and Houston was the beneficiary. At the same time that the storm hit, Spindletop was coming in on the, in the Port Arthur area, and the hydrocarbon economy of the Gulf Coast was, was born. So those two events came together to really put Houston on the map. Now, I actually had a business mentor, a guy named uh, Jake Hershey, if any of you were around Houston uh, back 20, 30 years ago, uh, a couple of decades back. Um, and Jake asked me one time, he said, Blackburn, have you ever hear anybody lamenting the end of the horse and buggy? And I said, no, I've never heard anything like that. And he said, well, you know, the wealthiest people at a point in time were those that were uh, basically raising horses and making buggies. And within a 10 years, that whole kind of wealth making potential was gone. And the internal combustion engine and modern day automobiles came along. And of course, this happened at the same time that oil was discovered on the Texas coast. Uh, so all of these things combined to make Houston an incredibly powerful place. But keep in mind, if money making is over here and a business and corporation entrepreneur is here, they're going to get right over there as quick as they possibly can. They will go to where the money is. That's what happened with the horse and buggy. Maybe what happens with the automobile. Now, this is Houston and Harris County's population growth. Uh, as you can see, it was pretty flat until 1900 and took off. Um, Harris County still going up. Houston's flattened out a bit. But together, we have about 4.4 million people. Uh, have uh, basically about the, uh, I think, in the, we're in the, probably the top 60 in the world in terms of GDP economies today. Uh, it's an amazing success story that has taken place over about a century, a little more. Parallel to that is the rise of carbon emissions. Uh, basically from virtually nil in the, in the early 1800s, uh, up to about 10 billion tons, 9.5 billion tons of carbon, uh, which translates into carbon dioxide by a multiplier of about 3.6, um, to get up to 
25, 30 billion tons of carbon dioxide. In the United States, it's about 7 billion tons of carbon dioxide. During that same time, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere has gone from about 300 to now just over 400 parts per million. Uh, it's a major concern uh, to countries throughout the world. Uh, it's something we don't talk about much in uh, Houston, or at least haven't up until probably Harvey. And you're hearing a lot more now about climate change than you used to. Still at the Texas level, we don't talk about it much at all. And uh, right now, we're backing off of it at the United States governmental level. But that's not the case around the rest of the world, and it's not the case with most of the cities of the United States. You will see leading thinking come out and out of cities in the United States in the next four to five years because it's been an abdication of power with regard to carbon dioxide. And that's essentially the, the, the context within which Houston's future will, un, will unfold. Harvey. Tropical storm in green intensifies to a Cat 4 hurricane probably faster than any storm in history. Gulf of Mexico was the hottest body of water, or among the hottest bodies of water, water in the world when Harvey formed. Came ashore as a Cat 4 and stopped. Never happened. Backed up and just continued to dump rain all over the coast. After that, 2018, January, Amazon says Houston doesn't make the top 25 of its list of candidate cities. A lot of people in town were just blown away by this, couldn't believe it. You know, I kind of, kind of say, well, I'm not surprised because there's some issues. And I think Houston is finding itself in the throes of a dilemma. I think we've got a 20th century town or city in the midst of the 21st century and it's going to have to make some changes. It's at the crossroads, and it needs to start re-examining a few key issues. So let's talk about flooding. Probably our greatest moment was all the volunteers coming out to rescue people that, uh, frankly, were flooded all over the community. Harvey flooded everybody. That was unlike many of our other storms. Um, Allison. Back in 2001, uh, was a major storm event, but it really poured most of its rain on the east, northeast, and north side of Harris County. But look at the name of that document. This is Harris County Flood Control District document. Off the charts. Now, I think that what they were intending to say, because Harris County Flood Control District has not yet admitted that they are really believe in climate change, or at least not officially. But if you were to describe climate change or have a climatologist explain climate change, they would explain it that essentially we're talking about rainfall that will be off the chart. We're talking about temperatures that will be off the chart. We're talking about aberrations. Harris County put that on the title, but mainly they were talking about it as a one-off event. Except we had the tax day flood. And that basically was a flood of record on all of these streams you see in the west and northwestern side of Harris County. By some estimates, a 10,000-year storm. Allison was way beyond a 500-year storm. Allison dropped 24 inches of rain in 12 hours. Tax day wasn't quite that intense, but it flooded all of these streams with the flood of record. Then you have Harvey. Our four-day... 500-year rainfall event of, you know, in terms of our planning, the records is 21 inches. Harvey doubled it. You're not supposed to double the 500-year event. That's just not supposed to happen. But it did. Down here, Harvey was a 20,000-year-plus event under current statistics. 20,000, really kind of think it really comes out to 50,000. This is City of Houston data. I mean, we have experienced a 50,000-year event, according to the old statistics. So, I am going to give you a 
facetious lesson in statistics here. This is the bell curve. Most of our design is based on averages, the things that happen most frequently in the distribution of data over time. Uh, if we're looking to plan for the 1% rainfall event, it would fall somewhere in here. 100 year flood is used for planning all over this part of the world, all over the United States. There's Allison. There's tax day. There's Harvey. It's not supposed to be happening. That's not the normal distribution that you're looking for. That's aberrant di distribution. That's changing statistical basis. Now, to my legal mind, I heard a presentation by a stockbroker talking about aberrations in the um, uh, bell curve, and he put this, these red lines up and he put TBD up there. And you know, to be determined, that just doesn't make sense. There be dragons. <laughs> <laughs> there are dragons at the edge of the bell curve, and we are experiencing the dragons of climate change. And we're living it. Climate change is not something that's going to happen 50 years from now. It's happening now. That's something we just don't get. All of the statistics about people believing about climate change, everyone believes that the climate is changing, but it's affecting other people, or it's going to affect future generations. It's affecting us now. Our 100-year floodplain is obsolete. We use it for all of our plans. It is obsolete. Harris County and the city of Houston have both adopted the 500-year floodplain to be used as an interim measure because we're going to have to change it. We're going to have to make it larger. We've always thought about the 100-year floodplain as just being kind of a, something we have to develop around, with, through. It's something to circumvent. It's red tape. No, it's dangerous. It's an area to be left alone. Yet we have much of Houston within the 100-year floodplain. I don't have a total number of, of units in the floodplain. My thinking is we're over 100,000 units probably in the floodplains. I think over, I have heard numbers certainly in the 140, 150,000 range of, that were flooded in Harvey. It could, be, I have heard as high as 200,000. This is a new study that came out in late 2017 by NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, National Weather Service. All of these areas shown in green will be increasing the 100 year rainfall event in enlarging the 100-year storm. In Harris County, our current 100-year storm is, 12, uh, is uh, 13 inches of rain in 24 hours. That's going to be raised at least to 16 and 17. But this is all based on the past up to Harvey. This is not a future projection. I heard Catherine K Hayhoe, that great uh, uh, climate uh, uh, researcher, talk about you cannot look in the rearview mirror and see what's coming. We're not looking forward because we deny climate change. This is how it's going to hurt us. It's going to kill people because we're not looking forward on these issues. And it's probably going to kill a lot of people. We had a speed conference, Severe Storm Center conference here at Rice back in February 2018. Every scientist we talked to that, that came and talked to us that knew what they were talking about, they were qualified to speak to it. Every one of them said, the climate's changing, these rainfall amounts are going to get larger in the future. We have not seen the worst yet. And we will see Harvey again and again. We're in a new norm weather-wise. As particularly disturbing with regard to surge events. Harvey was a rainfall event. These surge events are incredibly dangerous. We have critical industry in Texas City, although it is protected by a 17-foot levee. Critical industry in Bayport, and of course we've got the Houston Ship Channel. That's probably the, probably the center of United States jet, the military grade jet fuel pr uh, production. This is what we project. 
Speed Center has an arrangement with the University of Texas. We use their supercomputer to simulate storms. The worst case storm for our region is a storm coming ashore down at the south end of Galveston Island, San Luis Pass. Circulation comes around and basically the full thrust of the surge comes up into the bay. That's 25 feet from a storm that's a high category three, low category four. Ike plus 15%. Now Ike was a big storm. It was very, very wide. And that's one of the new storm characteristics you're gonna see, I think, talked about more and more in the future. Ike should not have had the surge it did, but it was so big, so wide, that it swept a lot of water ashore. But Ike came ashore right here, so the worst of it was back over here, and frankly, Orange, uh, the industries in Orange probably took the, the hardest hit of any area on the coast. This is coming. The ship channel's protected to 15 feet. Once we get beyond 15 feet, we're talking about flooding uh, the industrial complex. There's 4,400 storage tanks there. 2,200 of those storage tanks will be flooded by this storm event. Uh, Jamie Paget at Rice estimates that about 90 million gallons of oil and hazardous substances will be released. Exxon Valdez was 10 million gallons. Deepwater Horizon was 210 million gallons. So it's somewhere in between those two events and it all will go first into the neighborhoods and then into Galveston Bay. It will be the worst environmental disaster in United States history if we don't get protection built soon. Now the one thing I can tell you the good spot about Harvey, we have been told at Speed Center that we're crazy, that this storm could never occur. It's too big. If we had modeled this storm, they would have certified us. <laughs> but it happened. So at least we have the precedent of these unprecedented storms to talk about now. Because we're going to see more of them in the future. Now I want to switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about Houston and oil and gas. Now, climate change is what I've been discussing in the context of Harvey. Uh, we do not have a climate response program in the United States that is certainly regulatory in nature. We have nothing. And so what I'm going to talk about is not regulation. I'm going to talk about markets because markets are what will basically be acting in the next three to four years uh, in the absence of what I'm sure will be the absence of federal uh, legislation coming. And think about the oil and gas industry in Houston. We're trying to diversify our economy, but our economy is still highly dependent on oil and gas. Uh, I mean, about 400, 500,000 jobs, 50% of the economy, probably. Now, climate's changing, and humans are changing. It's pretty well accepted by the scientific organizations of the United States and of the world. Uh, 80 national academies of science around the world have accepted it, so have these organizations. The target is 450 parts per million coming out of the Paris Agreements, COP21. Um, that basically means that there's gonna have to be a significant change in the current economic model. Right now, there's nothing enforceable, but things are changing. If you're going to become carbon neutral, and by the way, carbon neutral is the, the, the new kind of planning buzzword. That is going to be the planning for the future. It's both sustainable, sustainable development, sustainability, and carbon neutral planning. To get carbon neutral, you got three ways to do it. You can avoid, you can minimize, or you can mitigate. You avoid, um, I'm sorry, you avoid by renewables. You minimize, mitigate by more efficient vehicles and different types of vehicles. Uh, there are many cities in Europe that have now basically said that by 2030, their downtown districts will be essentially free of internal combustion engines. Think of the horse and buggy. Is the internal combustion engine about to go away? It's possible. Look at the pressure. 
that's on the oil and gas industry. Right now, non-regulatory. If you have not read Pope Francis's encyclical, Laudato Si, read it. It's the most revolutionary faith document that has been written probably, uh, certainly from an environmental standpoint, ever. Uh, but he comes out incredibly strong against, uh, or basically about climate change and against carbon emissions. Not only because of the impacts, but because of the inequity of the impacts. Financial, you're starting to see divestment. You're seeing divestment for moral reasons. University of California system is divesting of oil and gas because they think it's a poor economic risk. Litigation, New York and Massachusetts. Uh, watch what's going on with those attorneys general over there. Uh, Exxon Mobil has been the target, but all of the oil companies could easily be. Question is, are the oil companies, or did the oil companies tell stock buyers one thing publicly while internally, there is a different set of analyses going on. Most of these companies have been incredibly sophisticated for decades about climate change. But their public posture and their private posture have been different. I think the attorneys general of New York and, New and Massachusetts want to know where their voters defrauded. Were their citizens misled? And that raises the question of fiduciary responsibility of boards of directors in terms of disclosure. Is there a duty of full disclosure to your stockholders? It's an interesting area. And then you have basically public opposition and voluntary carbon neutrality on behalf of a lot of corporations. Ben Van Bearden, the um, Shell CEO, Understanding what climate change means is one of the most important strategic questions on our mind today. We are testing the boundaries of our thinking. Intention for Shell to make most of its money from clean energy in 20 years, such as renewables, hydrogen, or carbon capture. A new business plan for Shell. A different business plan. This is what they think in terms of net CO2 emissions from Shell. And that red line I'm going to come back to later is incredibly important, and that's carbon capture and storage. Harris County, we're the leading carbon dioxide emitter in the United States. We are the leading county. We're number one. And from an economic standpoint, I would just tell you, the analogies to the Rust Belt are not wrong. Now, the Rust Belt didn't do much about what was coming at them. We have choice about that. That's what the rest of my presentation is going to be about, is that in flooding. Carbon neutral movement, these are the carbon neutral declared cities in the world. These will be the cities that will be among the most competitive in the future. In the United States, D.C., New York, Boston, Minneapolis, Toronto, Boulder, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Vancouver right now. Santa Fe, New Mexico wants to be carbon neutral. I uh, just came back from there. And then these other cities around the world. These companies are either committed to being carbon neutral or they have, to, uh, have committed to 100% renewables as a starting point. Um, and this is just a, a, a it's not even close to being all of them. This is just the start. Some of the corporate literature is amazing. Go read corporate websites, companies you're invested in. See what their policies are with regard to carbon. Every one of them knows their carbon footprint. And many of them have a plan for beginning to minimize the carbon footprint. Because in the future, if I'm concerned about my carbon footprint, I want to buy from someone that has zero carbon footprint because otherwise it comes onto my carbon footprint. So carbon accounting is going to be the future of business. It's going to be the future of cities. And Houston isn't looking good on that right now. So what can we do? Well, how about driving carbon neutral, carbon free? I can sequester the carbon dioxide emissions from a um, 
an automobile with normal driving for one year on 88% of a football field. Nature-based carbon dioxide capture and storage actually is going to be the answer. We've spent a lot of money looking for technology solutions to grab carbon and sequester it deep into the subsurface. Turns out nature can do it. It's just mind-boggling, though, that think that nature is the best technology. Go figure. How about if I wanted to um, neutralize the carbon emissions from a refinery? 150,000 barrel refinery, I need 500 mid-sized ranches. I need about six-tenths of, uh, of Texas, about a million acres for 150,000 barrel refinery. If I take care of all the customers, I'm up to about 3% of Texas. And I need about 5.3 million acres. It's doable. All I gotta do is pay the landowners, put my carbon in the ground. Carbon ranching will be the future of agriculture. Carbon farming, carbon ranching. How about making ExxonMobil carbon neutral? If you take their customers into account, they need 25% of the grazing land in the United States. It's doable. They don't have to buy the land. They just simply have to pay the farmers to put the carbon in the ground. But there may not be room for everybody. It's going to be a limit to how much nature can store. Shell is now committed to nature's capital. One of the most amazing conversations I ever had was at the Rice Faculty Club with a couple of researchers at Shell when they were telling me essentially this same story except for Shell. And they said, you know, we need about three quarters of the state of Texas to sequester our footprint, but we, you know, it's doable. Environmentalists don't think that way. It's the biggest problem with environmentalism today is it's not thinking big enough. Oil and gas think big. That's what I like about working with them. So we've got to unlock nature's resources. And guess what? Houston is, you, is wonderfully strategically placed because we have actually abundant ecological resources. We've got some of the best growing, some of the best carbon sequestering ecosystems of anywhere in, in probably the world, certainly in the United States. The yellow here, the prairies, the prairie grasses uh, have roots, uh, I'll show you in a minute, about 15 feet deep. They're wonderful. All of this up here on the top, all of the green are forests of different types. These are forest systems here. These are forest systems. And then we have the marshlands along the coast. All of those systems sequester carbon. And right now, it's being done for free, and it's being done inefficiently. Ecological systems de deliver services, most of which we don't pay for. You get paid if this timber's on your land. You get paid if you run cows. You lease your land for hunting quail. Um, but sequestering carbon, nobody gets paid for that right now. Creating water supply, nobody gets paid. How about solving our flood problem? Nobody gets paid for that. But they can and they should be. Carbon dioxide is removed by trees. We all know that, basic photosynthesis. This is the root system of the prairie grasses. This is where the carbon goes. We want soil health. Soil health is the key to a carbon neutral future. There is more work going on with soil right now than just about anything I've run across. And these potatoes, just think carbon. We're growing carbon in the ground. And it's worth $40 a ton probably. Right now, the market's about 10 to, 15, 10 to $12 a ton. Once the competition heats up, $40 a ton, I think, will be the, the amount. You can probably get four tons an acre with certain types of practices on a uh, normal ranch. 160 bucks an acre. 
figure about half of that goes to overhead commissions. You know, pick up an extra 80 bucks an acre per year uh, on top of your cattle operation. Maybe pick up some money for storing floodwaters. And you begin to change the economy of farming and ranching in the United States. You're basically restoring the carbon cycle. And this is what's been called the circular economy. The water cycle, the carbon cycle, basically making the economy conform to natural cycles rather than a straight line going up to the moon, beyond the limit. With the carbon, you measure a starting point, come back three years later, measure the increase, and that's what you get to sell, carbon in the ground, proven resources. This is sort of like finding an oil play, except it's a, nat it's a nature play. It's a very interesting concept. The area in red is the sweet spot. All the way up through the central United States, yellow and green have potential. Um, and of course, Texas has a huge swath of it, much of which starts right here in Houston. And if you run your cows in a certain way, adaptive multi-padded grazing, amp grazing techniques, you can augment the amount coming in. If you wanted to offset Houston and Harris County's carbon footprint, we need 23,000 square miles, or about 8% of the surface area of Texas. If we were smart, we would be securing these rights right now to keep our industries alive. Down here on the coast, it would be good to pay these same ranchers for storing surge water. Minimize future damages from flooding as well as give them income from carbon. Katy Prairie, west of Houston. If Attics and Barker Reservoirs break, that area will be flooded. These are two of the six most dangerous reservoirs in the United States, according to the Corps of Engineers. We need to hold water back here. That's the Katy Prairie. We paid farmers $100 an acre per year to store flood water across 100,000 acres. We could do a whole lot of good. And what is that? 10 million a year? I mean, we're talking billions to build alternatives. We could do that, and it's a totally different way of thinking about flood control. This is what the prairie looked like during tax day. Think about that all being concrete. Think of that all being drained. Where's all that water going to go? It's a different way of thinking about flood control, about carbon, and about the economy. Now, this is one of my favorite images. This is from our, our friend Anna Loos, who is over in the Netherlands. That guy's happy. That's intended. They know how to live with water in the Netherlands. That's a flood-proofed house. We need to learn to live with water. It's not going to go away. We're going to have to change our mindset. This used to be right here where the levee was on the river wall in the Netherlands. And this river was walled in. The river wall was walled in. That levee has now been moved back because they have decided in the Netherlands they need to make more room for the water. They have broken open polters that used to be protected and allow it to flood now. They've moved their farmers up to high spots so they can flood areas that used to be protected by levees because they have decided they need to learn to live with the water. In Houston, we've got this whole system of floodplains, but we've got that dark purple area that basically is outside of the floodplain. This is where our future is going to be. In green, you see essentially the areas that we need to evacuate to make room for the river. That also corresponds with the trail system and green space. It would give us the space we need to put channels in, but to also let the river flood. 
with our increasing flood, you cannot depend that the 100-year flood that is being used for design purposes today is anywhere close to the 100-year, the true 100-year rainfall today. We need more space for water. What about each of us being asked to take care of our rainfall? Hold rainfall on our property. Rainfall collection, storage, my mean elimination of grass and putting in absorptive material. Grass is just like concrete. It's not, it's not much better than concrete. It has a root system about, a, what, a half an inch, an inch. It barely penetrates the soil. The soil does not take a lot of water in. It's not absorptive. Again, rethinking. I told you, you you would think I was talking about a deal with the devil, and I find out actually when I talk about yards, I offend more people <laughs> than just about anything. And then finally, I'd like to show you what we could do. This is the so-called Ike Dike down here on the coast, and that's about a 10 to $12 billion, probably minimum $10 billion project to stop surge coming in up across the coast. It really isn't designed to protect the barrier islands. It's designed to protect the Galveston Bay infrastructure. But I want to focus on this. This is an alternative we've developed here at Speed Center. This is the Houston Ship Channel. The dredging on the Ship Channel could be, you could make it 25 feet. You could build your levee here and then put the, the what they call, used to call spoil, they now call beneficial use material. <laughs> We would put this beneficial use material back here and can make wetlands and can make uh, uh, some wonderful things. And an architect, Rob Rogers, who's a Rice graduate up in New York, got hold of this, this image or this concept. Uh, this is our modeling of how good it would work. This is a $3 billion alternative, by the way. And it pretty well protects everything that needs protecting. But then in the architect's hands, we could do something pretty remarkable with these types of, um, of solutions. And we could actually access the bay and make this a center point of attraction. The gate structure that would be built right here, uh, in the Netherlands, people come all over the, from all over Europe to see the gates that they have built at the Maislant Barrier. These will be huge gates. They have to be 65 feet deep and 25 at least feet above the water surface. And at least in the Netherlands, the whole system stands out of the water and then is, float, is, then is sunk into position as it goes out. Um, this is, uh, again, Rob Rogers' idea. And of course, he had to put fireworks at the end of it. The point being, we need to think differently. We need to learn to play the guitar. This presentation I've given you has, was published yesterday by the Baker Institute in a little different form. I added food to this one that's in writing. You can get a copy of this uh, from um, Baker website. It just got put up, like I say, yesterday. And um, it says book signing in the lobby. There'll be no book signing. But uh, <laughs> me, many of these ideas were put in a new book I published called A Texan Plan for the Texas Coast. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you talked about grass and lawns, and I've been noticing um, so often I've tried so many different neighborhoods, and they are pretty down, cutting grass, and when they use their blowers, they go straight to the streets. I know. Even on Kirby Drive in, in, in Wood Road, since I wrote a letter, uh, I wrote an email to the flood department. I couldn't agree with you more, but it's about norms, and it's about what's acceptable, and it's about, you know, I mean, I'm not sure I recommend you walk up to your neighbor and tell them uh, to change their practices, but 
I think we're going to have to get the garden clubs to change. I think we're going to have to get neighborhood associations to change because this is larger than a single person. But these are ideas that I think are important. <coughs> now, how many of you are Rice graduates? Okay. I've been wanting to poll Rice graduates on this. <laughs> okay. What about landscaping here on campus? What if some brilliant professor came up with the idea? Why don't we turn all of that cut grass on Rice campus into a restored prairie? How many of you would sit there and go, there's no, oh, no way, no way, no way. I'm not going to ask you to show your hands. But tradition. Institutions have traditions. How willing are we to change our traditions? How willing are we to take on a whole different look? Because, frankly, it's the right thing to do in terms of flooding, in terms of thinking about the future. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, just kind of a couple of observations slash questions. You know, this is a big picture, and that's great. Let's just put it all out of the prairie. But there are a lot of things that can be done locally that we aren't doing. For example, in my neighborhood, 50 years ago, the houses were maybe 1,200 square feet, and the lots are, you know, that was 10% of the lot. These days, the houses are 50, 60% of the lot, and the trees are gone. And that's happening all over Houston. I've seen one article in the Chronicle that mentioned, oh, yeah, well, we've changed some other things. I think all of those have to be put in the same context as the ones I was talking about. Uh, for example, the electric car. I mean, you've still got to offset whatever residual emissions there are. Natural gas is better than coal, but there's still emissions from that whenever you generate. I heard, uh, again, someone talking yesterday, uh, talking about, you know, uh, mini nuclear, uh, looking at different options. Of course, battery storage is what a lot of people are looking for in terms of renewables, but when you make all those products, there's emissions. We're going to be doing carbon, uh, basically, accounting across the board. That's when I was talking about supply chain and who you're buying from. So I agree with every point you made. I only had 40 minutes, so, uh, you know. <laughs> I, I just thought I'd just try to, to see if I could really make you afraid about the devil that I was dealing with. But uh, yes, sir. So you talk about this mechanism of, you have the diagram that said that it's kind of non-governmental pressure forcing the oil companies or the generators to change the behavior and then you're saying it's actually that these are so valuable because it's the same carbon. Correct. So do you foresee that that so the whole I mean I guess one of the buzzwords is the idea of internalizing the cost of carbon. Correct. How do we how do we change the system so that those costs can become internalized so that can be done through those societal pressures? I th I think that will get us started. And I think once it starts, I think it will have a, a, a really a force and a power of its own. So yeah, I do think those societal pressures, which I call market pressures, I mean, if it's exhibited through money, I mean, it's one thing I sit there and I, you know, stand outside of ExxonMobil and, and say, you know, I'm really not really happy about what you're doing. But if somehow they feel financial pressure, they will respond to that. And I think that's the scale at, what, at which this change will occur. I think that's what uh, Shell is saying. They're feeling it. Now, they're, of course, a European company. I think what they're feeling in Europe is a little different than what the U.S. company. I've created a, 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 we came up with the idea at Speed Center about creating an exchange for helping the ranchers to begin to understand that they could market carbon uh, storage. And uh, we have got two oil and gas companies right now that are willing to invest to help us develop that system one of which thinks they can sell carbon neutral gasoline, and the other one it just thinks that they need to be essentially aware and to have a portfolio of options in the future. So I think they're, every one of these companies is feeling it right now. They just don't quite know, sort of like they've got an itch and don't know quite how to scratch it yet, but 
uh, I think that you'll find there's a lot of different interesting ideas being pursued. Yes, sir. Black dirt. And with that, I've been told I need to stop. <laughs> Thank you.